Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started? We're having audio problems in the remote room, so please bear with us. Uh, if we don't get it sorted out real quickly, we might have to have people coming in here. Okay, let's get started. We've got uh, a couple of important checkpoints coming up. As we tried to make clear to everybody when you met with us during the first checkpoint, uh, we're sort of at a time critical point of the semester where we want everybody's team to essentially get started buying stuff because in about three weeks or so, you have to have a hovercraft built and hovering. So if you're going to take the first two of those three weeks waiting for your parts to arrive, you'll be frantically trying to get everything built at the last minute. So we're trying to lean on you to get everything purchased so that you don't have to wait too long. So checkpoint two is coming up in your skills lab in the next couple of weeks. Uh, if, if you're ready this week, you can go ahead and do it this week. But at the latest, you have to have it handled before you, you essentially give your, your design concept oral presentation, which will be next week in class. Uh, this checkpoint two is fairly fairly easy to do. Uh, I'll get to it in, in one second. But I recommend at least taking care of the things that you need to have done for that checkpoint as soon as possible. And I'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Next week, pretty big deal. Uh, in your skills lab, you're going to be making design concept report presentations, essentially. An oral version of the report that you submitted uh, two weeks ago now, I guess it was. And you had, or this week, if you haven't, haven't done that yet, this week you'll be doing some basic uh, public speaking types of exercises. Next week is the one that really counts. Your team will be expected to give a roughly seven to 10 minute presentation on your hovercraft. And we've given some pretty uh, explicit instructions on how to prepare for that. But we're looking for a professional grade presentation. So no t-shirts and shorts and flip flops and all that kind of thing. We want to see you dressed up in something approaching professional attire and making a professional presentation using all of the skills that you hopefully pick up by reading the book and by um, going through the activity in uh, class. Guys, if we can keep the chatting down, please. Checkpoint three is hovering in place. That's going to be in the first week of November. I think initially we said that we were going to do it only on Wednesday, but we've just changed our mind and we'll make it Wednesday and Thursday. This first checkpoint, I think we scared everybody into going at 9 or 10 o'clock on, on the first morning, and no one came on the second day because everyone came on the first day. So I'm not going to scare you. That backfired. Last year, everyone showed up like at the end of the day, and we were there to something like 9 or 10 o'clock at night. Uh, this year, everyone came at 11 o'clock in the morning and waited four hours until, I don't think our line got short until about 5 or 6 o'clock. So half of you agree to come on Wednesday, and the other half can agree to come on Thursday. Well, I guess what we're saying is uh, try to find a good time that, that works for you, and hopefully by spreading it out over two days, it won't be so bad. I can say that the rest of the checkpoints for the semester generally go quicker than the first one did. Uh, the actual time spent uh, with a TA or, or with us is a lot more quick. So for checkpoint three, you have to hover in place for three minutes. Last week, I thought it was two minutes. I double-checked. It's actually three minutes. And you also have to be able to demonstrate the basic ability to move forward and we have a certain minimum distance that you have to move forward. Now, you do not actually have to have your propulsion system designed and built. Like, for example, if you're using a weight shift to be your propulsion mechanism, you don't need an NXT powering a relay with a motor and a fuel cell. You don't have to do all that. Just pick up your weight and move it with your hand and demonstrate to us that it does actually go forward at a speed that satisfies the, the criteria. Uh, we're expecting you to do this primarily to get you guys thinking about these types of things. And you might have, like for example, if you were planning to shift a weight that weighs, uh, you know, one ounce, hopefully you've discovered whether or not one ounce will actually do the job or how much of a shift in distance it needs to be. If you're planning to use a propulsion technique that relies on a propulsion fan, fan pointing out backwards that's blowing you down the course, you should have that fan mounted, plugged in, whatever. You don't need to have it controlled by the computer 
or the fuel cell or anything like that, you can just plug it into a separate battery. We want to make sure that that fan is not too wimpy to actually get you down to the other end of the course in the specified amount of time. So check out the rules. We've posted them for both checkpoints two and three. So checkpoint two, this is the one that's coming up sooner. Uh, the main idea for checkpoint two is we want to see evidence that you guys have actually got this stuff or have made the purchase, maybe you don't have it in your hands yet, of the things that you need to do checkpoint three. Okay, so it's fairly straightforward. The one piece of detail, if you haven't uh, nailed down what your battery circuit looks like, we want you to show us that. And before you ever actually plug in your fans into your main battery pack, we want you to, to meet with your TA or one of the TAs so that we can double check it. This is one of those safety issues in the class. When we have accidents in this class, if it's not people cutting their fingers off or something like that with something sharp, well, actually, no, no, no dismemberments happened. But we did have like 15 stitches last year from box cutter accidents. Besides that, the accidents that we tend to have are people short-circuiting their batteries on things that hurt, like their body parts. And these battery packs can deliver up to 30 amps. And if you're not careful, that can really hurt you. So it's like any electrical device. We want you to try to do it as safely as possible. So see a TA and get cleared on actually plugging everything in. Okay. What constitutes proof that you've actually purchased things? Well, if you've bought it online or something like that and don't have it yet, you, obviously you can't show it to us. So print out the receipt, show up to the checkpoint with the receipt, and that'll be fine. If you are using something that you got for free, maybe you already had batteries or a fan lying around or something like that, and you don't have an actual receipt, then bring the actual object to us. Okay? For your deck materials, some of you are going to buy like eight foot long sheets of styrofoam, things like that. You don't have to bring us the whole sheet. Bring us the receipt for something like that, and uh, you should be fine. Overall, it's worth 20 points, and it's a fairly easy checkpoint to do, provided you've taken the time to actually buy your stuff or, or get your stuff. Okay? So please get that taken care of. You don't have to actually hand it in until just before you give your oral presentation. Um, but uh, I recommend trying to take care of it as soon as possible. So the actual checkpoint is during your skills lab. You don't have to come to the class, uh, to the EDL. Well, I guess you do. That's where the skills labs are. We don't have a special day set up for them the way we do for the, the checkpoint three afterwards. OK, so we're sort of transitioning these lectures uh, uh, for the rest of the semester, where we're not focusing quite so much on how to build a hovercraft and on the basic science and engineering and calculations and things like that. We're going to start talking a little bit more about generic things relating to the engineering design process, creativity, the profession of engineering, and, and all these other types of things. So today's first topic is going to get to these uh, from the point of view of you know, problem solving. But before we get to that, I have a couple clicker questions that are going to help me figure out where you guys are. So first question. And for those who are in the gallery joining, I don't know if the other classroom has its audio problem sorted out. The, the channel number for this classroom is 65 if you haven't uh, logged into this one, which is, not, which is different than the other classroom. So let me get this started here. All right. Hopefully you've purchased all of these, or at least initiated your purchases, based on our advice from the checkpoint last week. Your deck construction materials, maybe not. You might be planning to get that locally. All right. OK, where'd the results go? Here we go. So none of these. OK, we got 14% of the teams of all three. That's good. We, we really expected that we'd have more than 24% that have at least their batteries and their fans ordered. Um, these are the things that can take a lot of time, especially I mean, if they have it in stock, good. Um, you might actually have it within a week or two. Uh, if you haven't placed orders for things like this and you plan to, be aware the shipping process itself might take a couple of weeks. If you're ordering something that's not in stock, you might not get that until next winter. All right? That's a problem. And that's not our fault. That's your fault. All right? When you show up to the next checkpoint and telling us that your fans haven't arrived yet, that's something you have to work out. It's a, a product. It's a, uh, product delivery thing that, that you have to make sure you deal with uh, in, in any business situation. If your customer is expecting your product on a certain deadline, 
Got to do that. Okay, so please take care of that. So the next uh, few topics, actually we're going to bounce around a little bit the next few weeks, but today we'll talk about problem solving methods. And today's mostly a fun lecture. Well, I think it's fun. Um, do a lot of brain teasers, things like that, where I'll be encouraging you to think about how you're thinking. Think about the process by which you solve problems, brain teasers, things like that. So first one, quick exercise. You might even want, if you have a piece of paper, some of the activities we're going to be doing today might work better if you can sketch things or keep track of your thoughts on a piece of paper. But consider this problem. You're in a house with three switches down in the basement and three light bulbs up in the attic. Okay, and you are down in the basement. And your task is to figure out which switch turns on which light bulb. If you ever lived in a house with a fuse goes bad, trying to figure out which fuse flips that light switch, you know, same kind of a problem. But the, the challenge here is, how would you identify which of the switches actually corresponds to which light bulb in the attic? You can forget th th this red box. That, that just helps me explain how to solve this. Um, how would you figure this out, making only one trip from the basement up to the attic? Why don't you take like 60 seconds? You can talk about it with your friends. If you know the answer, don't spoil it for other people. But think about it. So I'll give you 60 seconds or so. Okay, so rather than asking for answers, I'll just proceed with uh, discussing how you might approach this kind of a problem. Now, the I idea here isn't to give you brain teasers and stump you on things like that. That's not really what the objective here is. The objective with the rest of this lecture, where we're going to do a, a variety of these things, is to start you thinking about how you solve problems. Engineers and scientists and all sorts of other people, we try to break problem solving into organized procedures, recipes, steps. Okay. And there's a lot of different ways you can approach a problem. Sometimes one approach won't work well for a certain kind of a problem. But there are some generic things that you can try to do. So how might we actually solve this kind of a problem? Well, at first, if you only have one trip, the idea of figuring it out by just trial and error, uh, hopefully you realize you, you can't really do that quite so easily. You have to be a little bit more clever in this particular situation. But you could, and if I allowed you two trips, you could probably figure it out through trial and error, or three trips. But in this case here, you can do it with one trip. Okay? And what you have to do is flip one of the switches on. All right? That's going to turn one of the light bulbs on in the attic. But you're not up there. You don't know which one it is. All right? Leave the light on for like five minutes, and then turn that switch off. All right, you're hearing a lot of O's, but I'm, I'm not, you, you, you might get it, and you might not get it. All right? Leave that switch, turn that switch back off, and turn one of the other two on and then walk upstairs. What should you see? One light. But what else? One of the other light bulbs will be hot or cold, right? The one that was hot was the first switch that you flipped. Okay? And by the process of elimination, the third one is the one that you never touched. Okay? Yeah, you have to be a little bit clever. Okay? So just to clarify here, you flip one switch, Turn the light bulb on, let it get nice and hot, turn it off, flip one of the other two switches, go back upstairs, one light will be on so you know, which, you know which, what the second switch turned on, and the one that's hot is the one that the first switch turned on, and the one that's neither is the remaining one that you never touch the switch. Okay? This is a problem-solving approach. I'm curious, how many of you, and at what stage through the process did you get in working this problem out? Okay? Let's just quickly answer that.
I'm going to shorten the time here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Some of you got it. I should have asked how many of you have heard this one before, and uh, that, that would also be a bit revealing for me. Now, the idea here is not necessarily to give you a bunch of trick questions. A bunch of them will be trick questions today, but they're intended to make you wary about the problems that, that you're being asked to solve. So hopefully, you tried working through the process in a brute force way where you think about all the different ways of possibly solving the problem. Oh, the audio is OK now? OK, good. OK, so let's move forward here. There's a variety of different problem-solving techniques. Some of them engineers really don't care much about. Um, like the scientific method, for example. Engineers don't use that quite so much, um, as, so much as the science, scientists do. But there are a variety of other techniques here. We're going to focus today on the use of sketching and tools to, to visually represent thought processes, sometimes visually represent the problem itself, and um, the process or the techniques of eliminating pro possibilities or, or the, the, the deductive approach to solving problems. In a couple of weeks, we're going to come back to more formalized approaches uh, of using matrix logic and, and working backwards through problems. Reverse engineering, working backwards, is a very common tool. But for today, we'll outline a, a, a generic methodology that I think is going to make some intuitive sense to most everybody. But some of these steps get skipped over very, very often. So first of all, State the problem in terms you understand, OK? State it clearly and state what is important about the problem. This is an important thing to keep in mind. In real world engineering problems, they're not going to give you all the stuff you need to solve the problem. And to make matters worse, what they do give you might not be needed to solve the problem. So they're, they're going to they're dazzle you with all sorts of they, the, the customer. They're going to tell you everything in the world about what they want. But they might not tell you everything that they should be telling you. And 90% of what they give you isn't actually needed to solve their problem. Part of your job as an, as an engineer is to understand what the problem really is, what's important, and what's not. That really fits into part one. And quite frankly, that can be one of the hardest parts of the problem. Because your customer oftentimes doesn't really know what they want. They think they know what they want, but they don't really have a clear idea of what is relevant and what's not. Okay? So identify the information that you have, the, the inputs to the process. These might be the resources you have, the time you have, the budget you have. They might be the, the current state of knowledge. Like for example, somebody wants something for which there is no technology. Right? So it's good to know that. So you've got to be able to tell them that right up front. Identify what you need to produce at the end. Your customer is definitely going to give you some guidance here, or the teacher might give you some guidance. They're asking you for a solution to this particular problem. Okay? But you obviously should know what you're looking for. Okay? Sketching the problem. This is something that your engineering faculty members and all of your other courses are going to be encouraging almost on day one. Uh, most of you, not all of you, are going to be taking statics in a semester or two, and you're going to be so sick and tired of drawing free body diagrams um, that well, you'll know what I mean. <laughs> Trust me. All right. Sketching problems is actually a good thing. It helps you, helps you frame the problem, helps you visualize the problem, but it will give you a couple of other benefits that we'll get to in a moment. And only at that point should you actually try to throw equations at it, throw math at it, throw logic, and solve the problem. It's important to do these first four steps thoroughly. It might seem obvious almost, but we all do this, including myself, where you get in a rush and you try to short circuit the process and take shortcuts, and you realize that, oh, geez, had I just sketched it out, I think I might have caught this problem. I just spent double on something that I really needed to spend, or something to that effect. And then finally, test and confirm your solution to the best extent you can. Sometimes your confirmation is going to be a, a plausibility test that you do yourself. Like, for example, um, they asked me to calculate uh, the distance between the two wheels of the front end of a car, and the answer I'm getting is 62 feet. Hopefully, you can apply a reality check to your answers. You can look at units to see if maybe your units aren't realistic. Like when you ask to get a velocity and you end up with meters per second squared rather than meters per second. 
right? Th those are, are usually good ways to test it. You aren't always going to be able to completely test everything, but a good engineer has the ability to test it at least partially to some level to see if something is quote unquote reasonable or not. So we'll come back to that kind of stuff. Here's a little bit of an illustration. Now imagine that, that you're a general contractor who's asked to build a swimming pool and put a concrete patio around the swimming pool, okay? Where the, the ramifications for your company are a cost thing. If you buy too much concrete or if you find that you have to do multiple pours of the concrete, the patio is going to end up being more expensive. You might even have to completely remake it entirely if you don't do it right. All right? So ordering too little concrete will require a second delivery. You might actually have quality problems if you pour partially cured, pour new concrete onto partially cored, poured concrete. That's a civil engineering thing. You realize you don't, you don't generally want to do that. Could be wasteful. And um, you definitely don't want to buy more than you needed, right? Because then you're paying for that. And they don't take concrete back at the mill, right? By the time you get it there, it's a, well, it's still concrete, but it ain't so flexible and so pourable, right? So your pool is a rectangle measuring 14 by 40 feet. And your deck should be concrete and six feet wide at all points, right? So a plausible engineering question is, how much concrete do you need? At least how many square feet of concrete do you need? So how would you approach this problem trying to apply these types of things? Well, state the needs, identify it. Some of these things are, are fairly straightforward with the problem I just gave you. Um, but sketching is where I want to look at for this one here. You have a 14 by 40 foot pool that should be surrounded by a six foot wide concrete patio. All right, so we can quickly do the math and say that, well, we have rectangles around each side. And if we're not careful when we do that, we realize that each one of these strips, if I measure it as being 52 feet wide, 6 feet deep, and you have one on the top, one on the bottom, and then 26 feet long by 6 feet deep on either side, if I then add all these together, and some of you might catch the problem with that immediately, if I add all these together, I'm double counting the corners. Okay? So I'm getting more concrete than I need. When I do the math here, I need 936 square feet. But each corner is being counted twice, when it should only be counted once. Okay, so the sketch, hopefully, helps me realize this mistake, right? These corners have to be handled carefully, okay? You could get more clever. A sketch, if had you not actually figured out where we're drawing the paths, you could realize that, well, I'm really talking about here a 52 by 26 rectangle minus the space occupied by the pool itself, which is 40 by 14. And you can just take the, the mathematical difference between the area of these two rectangles. That would be the most straightforward way of doing it. You could also draw your diagram a little bit differently. So rather than starting my rectangle in the corner, I start it here instead of here and draw it all the way to the top and start this one here and draw it all the way down to the bottom. And you could draw your, your sketch a little bit more carefully. But this is a simple situation. You know, real world problems are where you have to fit it around you know, one of these casino pools that look like a palm tree or something like that. right? And figuring out the area for that kind of a thing get even more complicated and you really are going to want to draw a diagram and figure that out uh, using a variety of different techniques. So diagramming or sketching of things not only can help you look at the details of the problem and visually, but sometimes problems that don't really represent themselves visually so, so well, you can cast them into a visual form, maybe a graphical form, and help make more sense of it. So consider this problem here. A worm is at the bottom of a 12-foot wall. And every day, the worm climbs up three feet, but every night, it slides back down two feet. How many days is it going to take that worm to reach the top of that 12-foot wall? So let's visualize this graphically, okay, where we have the height and the number of days. After the first day, it gets three feet up. I guess the first daytime portion. But at the night of that first day, it comes back down two feet. So, the net progress after one day is just one foot. Okay? Repeat this process. Each day, eventually, this thing is going to work its way up towards our goal of 12 feet. Okay? And just sort of doing the math here, we found that after, as this progress of going up three and coming down two, we would, after, the, after midday, you know, at the start of sunset, our worm reaches it on the ninth day. If we wait until we get to the tenth day, it actually has lost two more feet, or two feet back, and it comes back down. So we have to stop the process and tell that worm it was done uh, after, call it, nine and a half days uh, in this process. So this sketch that we've just done here 
isn't an actual picture of a worm climbing a wall, right? It's a visual representation of the progress that it made counteracted by the, the losses that it, that it suffered when it, wasn't, um, when it wasn't daytime, essentially. Okay, so this might be one approach to graphically or visually representing the problem. And these types of tools can be quite useful uh, when solving uh, problems. So these diagrams, not only are they useful for helping you solving things, but they help you explain things to other people, which in the real world, working as a team on your hovercraft or working at a company, you've got to be able to explain things to other people. And figures and sketches, chalkboards, the back of your uh, on napkin type sketches are, are very oftentimes uh, essential ways to explain things to other people. These visual representations can help you catch problems in your logic process, in your, in, in your analysis, double counting the corners on, on the swimming pool, for example. Right? And they sometimes help you just get everything started. They help you identify what calculation you have to actually figure out. Now, had I, began this pro had I begun this process with the worm by drawing a picture of a worm, that wouldn't have gotten me where I, really where I wanted to go. So you, you have to make some educated guesses about what's going to be useful, but hopefully uh, you'll be able to do this kind of a thing. For your hovercraft, sketching is was required, for one. You had to, had to have done that for your, uh, for your design concept report, and you will have to do that for your oral presentations as well. But when you look at this from a more formal point of view, it can help you design things. Like, for example, where to locate the things that have mass, right? One of the tasks you're going to have to do is balance your hovercraft so that it hovers stationary for checkpoint three. Right? Planning out where you're going to put the stuff ahead of time might save you some time later on. Planning out where you put your fans. If you've got two fans and you put them both on the left side of your deck, you're going to have some trouble balancing that thing. Okay? So a sketch, you might, those types of things you might visualize in your head quite easily. But a sketch of where to put your, your, lift, your lift fans, your propulsion fans, where to locate the rudder, where to put all the things that are heavy, might help you save some time later on. And in the engineering world, things can get complicated. You might discover that I, I really should be putting my fuel cell here, or my rudder should be here, but we were really hoping to put the battery pack there, because it's really heavy and it, and it works best right there. Or we want to put the battery right in the center, because it's the heaviest thing. Right? It helps keep us nice and balanced. But in the center, that's, what you were, that's where you were planning to put your propulsion fan. And the propulsion fan maybe is going to be rotating 180 degrees to get you going backwards and forwards. Right? So a sketch would help you catch those types of problems. Okay? So you're going to have to do this. If you haven't already done it, then um, you're going to be needing to do it soon. So let us know where you are on this stuff. At what point in your, in your design process did you actually start using sketches? They don't have to be formal CAD drawings with SolidWorks or AutoCAD or anything like that. At what point did you start sketching things, either to think about it yourself, to explain it to your teammates when you went home, when your mom and dad asked you what you were doing? Did you draw a sketch? I'm just curious. So let us, let us know. And again, th there's no wrong answer here. We're, we give full credit for, for all these answers. This has helped giving us some feedback. Partly, I'm just curious how much of you have this instinctually built into you. Many engineers tend to be visual thinkers, and you might have been doing it your entire life. Or maybe not. OK. So from the very beginning, and some of you after you started narrowing down your ideas and, and working out things. OK, that's good. For those of you who, who um, did it more late in the process, uh, it's OK. We haven't really covered this stuff just yet. We encourage that you try to do this early in the process, hopefully before you've gone too far, because it will help guide the process uh, as you go forward from there. So, whoops. All right. So, real world problems are complicated, okay? Problem solving, there's no one recipe for how to solve problems in engineering. I don't at all want to, to convince you of that. Problems in engineering are almost always really big. And You've all heard the old adage of how do you eat an elephant? And I guess there's two answers. One is very carefully, but if it's dead, then you can eat it one bite at a time. So let's look at this a little bit more. The first step that we use as engineers is to turn the problem that might seem initially complicated into something bite-sized, something simpler. Okay? On day one of the semester, we told you that you're going to be building a hovercraft. Right? And nine out of 10 of you probably said, 
really? I know nothing about that at all. Okay, that sounds complicated. Um, some of you might have said, sure, I did it already, or something like that. And, but by and large, we're giving you an intentionally complicated problem with lots of elements that you can separate out. The batteries don't really involve, other than being attached to a fan, they don't really directly influence your ability to predict if your hovercraft is going to get off the ground. The lift calculations don't have much to do with figuring out how long your batteries are going to last, except for the fact that they both have fans that draw a current in there. Okay? And similarly to all the other stuff that we've dealt with, it's a large task that can be broken down into small pieces. This is the way it's done out in, in, the, work, in the workforce, in the real world, okay? where companies are set up to break things down into parts, where you work on maybe the mechanical design team. You, you focus on structures. Another team that you have to meet three times a week, or maybe even work side by side with, they deal with software. A third team deals with marketing. They're not even engineers. A fourth team deals with bean counting. All right, all right, accounting. All right, right. All right. you can tell I've had a bad day with the accountants. Um, there are people whose job is to keep track of the details, of the financial side of things, making sure that you follow all the rules. They have their part of the project. That, that's an important part of the engineering project, staying on budget, staying on time. Okay? So breaking things into pieces makes complicated problems more manageable. And in the, work, the real world, you might have 30,000 engineers working to build that airplane that, that you are helping with. That's not an exaggeration. There might literally be tens of thousands of engineers working on the same airplane as you're building. Okay? Of course, you don't know them all by name, but they're working in compartmentalized areas, supporting each other, and then they report up a tree, essentially, a hierarchical arrangement, and, and interspersed throughout the entire project are going to be people whose jobs are to make sure people are talking to each other. Okay? You might not have to know all 30,000 people. In fact, nobody will know all 30,000 people. But you have to know your sphere, and somewhere in your sphere of interaction is somebody whose job is to talk to other people, and they talk to other people, and it works its way on up the chain. And so ultimately, somebody has to present the project, or the, pro the product, rather, uh, to the customer. So reducing the problem is key. And let's step away from those big, real complicated problems and narrow it down to more small scale, but still somewhat complicated problems here. Eliminating things from the problem is the easiest way to make the project easy, to make it simpler. Okay? In your hovercraft, I made your life, whether you liked it or not, far easier by saying no internal combustion engines, no pneumatics, no burning of things, stuff like that. Okay? I, I simplified the problem for you. I, I cut down the range of possibilities. Some of you might not have liked that, but I narrowed the number of choices. As an engineer, you are going to strive to do this as much as you can because it makes your life easier to narrow things down. And the first step is to talk to the customer and say, do you really need that? I mean, if it's not obvious whether they need it. Ask the customer to narrow down the specifications because if they want something that does everything all the time for everybody, you might not be able to deliver that quite so easily. Okay, so asking them to narrow things down will make everybody's life easier. If you can rule things out, things get easier. So, you're presently faced with tasks of balancing a hovercraft. That's going to be your next, uh, well, your checkpoint three. You've got to balance the, the battery weight. Right? You need to figure out how long it's going to last. You need to figure out, is it going to put out enough current to power all your fans? If you have a lot of fans, that might actually be a, an issue here. You need to figure out, are the fans powerful enough? Not only to get you off the ground, but if you have a propulsion fan, is it powerful enough to get you all the way to the other end of the course and back? We're not going to teach you how to tell that part. If you have a propulsion fan, the teams who want to do this, we already talked with you, hopefully, about that. And if that fan is powerful enough or not, we're not showing you how to do that calculation. It's a bit beyond the scope of what we cover for fluid dynamics in this class. What we told you, essentially, is to put it together and try it. Okay? But that takes time and it takes money. You have to buy the fan. And you might find that the fan that you bought doesn't do the job. So make your life easier by crossing that one off to your lift and try something else first. Okay? That would be one approach to solving that problem. All right. It might not be as fun, but try it. Analyzing and incorporating a wide variety of things into your, into your process or your problem might be the most reliable way to reach your answer, your, your, your good solution, but it might be a lot of work, especially if you find that you have to test everything along the way. 
cross, off, cross things off your list as much as possible. And raise your hand quickly if you've played Clue at some point in your life. All right? This is a classic. It's like Monopoly right? or something like that. Think about how Clue works. Remember, you have a game board, and you, you, you go around to the various rooms, and you've got to figure out who killed who using what object and in which room they did it. Right? Colonel Mustard in the conservatory with the candlestick or something like that. Nowadays, that's old school. Nowadays, it's like Seinfeld or something like that. They, they, you walk around Seinfeld's apartment and you figure out who, you know, Elaine killed, whatever, you know, with a... Anyway, the idea here, the, the, the strategy that you use to, to come up with the answer and win this game is not unlike a lot of gambling activities. Blackjack, poker, right? You take the information you have, you see what cards are showing, or you, you listen to other people explain, you know, all right, they just asked for uh, whether, you know, for a person, an object, and a room from somebody, and they didn't give any back. So I know that they don't have any of that information, okay? That's a little bit of information that you can say that allows you to cross possibilities off your list. And the, I'm not going to explain how to play Clue from, from the whole uh, process here. But you can take information that's available and cross possibilities off, right? If you're playing blackjack and you see people play an ace, you know that there's no longer at least that one ace in the deck, okay? Or poker or so on and so forth, okay? So this process of elimination, we probably do in our everyday lives for a lot of stuff anyway. But it's a pretty uh, effective tool here. And it looks a little bit like the scientific method. It's not quite the same. But it involves making assumptions, testing those assumptions, and if the test fails, you can then cross that off. If the test doesn't fail, they didn't play an ace in the first place, so you just, you just don't know. You're, you're not any worse off than you started. You might have wasted some time. But generally speaking, uh, you work through a process of elimination, almost of, of trial and error. So uh, this is boring stuff. Let's get to the more fun stuff. OK, think about this little brain teaser here. Four angels sit on a Christmas tree at the top, midim, medium, and bottom levels. The angel at the top level can see the two below it. The two below it can see each other. D, however, is below a really thick branch, and, none of, and no one can see through this thick branch. Okay? Each one of these angels has a halo. Two of the four have blue halos, and two have yellow halos. Okay? The question is, which one of these four angels could be the first to guess what color of their halo is by simply looking at the other angels that they have in their field of view. So nobody can look up. They can look sideways and downwards unless it's being blocked by this, angel, by this thick branch. Pardon? Think about this for a couple seconds. You might want to sketch stuff out. Talk amongst your friends. I'll give you a minute. You probably, if you've seen this before, you'll get it. But if you haven't, you've got to think about this. You got to start looking at possibilities. You have to think about what the other angels know. Does, does they know what? No. OK, to be clear here, the angels cannot see their own halos. They, they cannot see their own halos. It's above their head, right? You can't, you can't see that. They don't have mirrors. All they can see is the other angles within their field of view. Angles. Angels. OK, let's just move on here and talk about this a little bit. There are actually two solutions. One is sort of dependent on what happens with the first. So the first one. If angels B and C both have the same color angel, uh, same color halo, the one above it can certainly tell that. Right? If A sees that B and C both are blue, then A can't be blue because there's only two blues. So A can then say, I know, but through the process of elimination, that I've got to have a yellow one if that's the case. All right? But if B and C both have different colors, A can't say that. D, well, D's just lost and can't, doesn't have any extra information. But what about B and C? They can't see A. B can see C. So if angels B and C have different colors, well, first of all, if, a and, if B and C have the same color, A would have raised its hand immediately. Okay? 
If B and C have different colors, the other possible solution, then one can essentially say that A must be silent, but B can essentially look over at C and draw a little bit of inference here. Okay? What can B assume? It can assume, first of all, that it doesn't have the same color as C does. Because if it did, A would have yelled. Okay? So B knows that whatever C has, they have the opposite of it. Okay? So the process of working through the possibilities here allows us to say that either B or we actually I could have reversed it and done it with C instead of B. Whichever one was quicker, mentally, they could have figured out that if A doesn't open its mouth, then I have to have whatever is the opposite of the person who's at the same level as me. Okay? This is a process of working through the problem by considering all of the possibilities from all the possible points of view. Okay? So, consider this other one. This one's a little bit more clever. A rancher tells his two sons, his, an old rancher tells his two sons that I'm dying. I need to figure out who to give my ranch to. Race your, cor your horses to Carson City, and the one of you whose horse is slower will get the ranch. Okay? The two sons say, huh? All right? Slower? Okay. All right. And they each get on their horse. They start going off, and all right, it's the race to see who's slowest, right? You can just envision what's going to happen here, right? They just wander around. Eventually, they, they find their way up in Virginia City a couple weeks later, and they come up to this wild, wise old gambler and say, look, we're just sick of this, right? Neither one of us is logically going to start going fast, right? Because then we just throw it away. How can we turn this into a fair contest, all right? The wise old gambler makes a simple recommendation. Where they, can issue, where they can solve this problem to figure out, in all good faith, whose horse is slower. What did the gambler say to them? Think about this. OK. Well. I want to get to some of the other ones here. So what could the gambler have said to them? We have ourselves sort of, the way the problem is phrased, it's a counterproductive problem, where there's no motivation to actually try to go fast. So what the gambler said was, switch horses with each other. How does that help? OK. By inference with that, if I switch horses with the other person, I'm going to go like hell after that, right? Because if I can beat them, I will have proven that the horse I'm on is faster. But he's got my horse, right? If I won, I've just proven that my horse that he's on is the slower one, OK? If both brothers are smart, we've effectively just turned this into an honest race, OK? Where they get on each other's horses, and they both go as fast as they can. And the one, whose horse, who, the one who wins the race actually loses the ranch, OK? <laughs> Actually, no, wins the ranch because the other person has the slow, slower horse. All right? So you have to think about the problem in all of its complexities from a lot of different points of view. Okay? Consider how you would solve a puzzle. You've all solved jigsaw puzzles, right? What goes into this? I'm sure you have your strategies. Like, okay, right? what are the classic strategies for this? Right? All of the edge pieces, you put those in a pile. All four of the corner pieces, all right, those are, you get those. You probably look at the pictures on the, I mean, doing a, a jigsaw puzzle of a white piece of paper, that, that, that's the worst, right? That takes you the longest, right? So you probably use elements of trial and error where you just see if things actually fit, but nobody's that stupid, right? You always have a strategy. You look at all the information. Are they edge pieces, corner pieces? Do they have a lot of yellow on them, depending on the picture that you do? They have the red lines, whatever. You look for, for patterns and things like that, right? You eliminate possibilities. For example, if you have got a dark region of your picture, you tend not to try to put a light piece there and then start experimenting with those. Okay. Similar types of things allow you to do. Reducing the problem into smaller parts makes it more tractable. Identifying regions of color, things that are edges, things that are corners, all these types of things are useful. So let's pay attention to the details. Consider this question here. A ladder hangs over the side of a ship that's anchored in a port. Okay, the bottom rung of the ladder touches the surface of the water. 
The distance between rungs is a nice and simple one foot. The length of the total ladder is 15 feet long. The tide is rising at the rate of four feet every hour. When will the water reach the fourth rung from the bottom of the ladder? Okay, so if you know these, again, don't spoil it for your neighbors, just think about this. Ten seconds. All right. Forty percent of you said one hour. Thirty-two percent said never. Those are the two most popular ones. Let's think about this. Boats float, right? When the tide comes in, the boat goes up, and the ladder's tied to the boat. The ladder goes up too. So it's never. Answer is five. Okay? Yeah, it was a trick question, but that's life. <laughs> life is a big trick question. All right. I don't know where everyone's going. Another one. If you've got three apples and take two away and the remaining one is sliced into two halves, how many do you have? How many apples, excuse me, I should clarify that. <laughs> Good question, whoops. Let me start that and how many apples? The question that they yelled out was how many what do you have? And that's a good question, that was my mistake though. Not germane to the problem. I'm gonna shorten the time here. This falls under the category of trick question, sort of. It's one of those questions where you should read the problem. Okay? One, two, three, none. Read the question. You take two away. You've got two. Right? Uh, okay. All right. This one you might have to think about. I'll let you, those of you who want to take off and lose the points, you're welcome to. But a man encounters a bear in the wild. There's nobody else there. Just the man and a bear and a gun. Okay? When they encountered each other, both were frightened and ran away from each other. The man went to the north, the bear went to the west. The man stopped suddenly, aimed his gun to the south, and shot the bear. What color was the bear? Huh? All right, give this one a shot. Whoops. All right, I'll give you 30 seconds for this one. We're done after this one. This requires some thinking. This one actually, it's not really a trick question. It's a clever question. All right. The answer is white. Now, why is that? OK. As it turns out, if you do the geometry of the Earth, the only way this could possibly give you an answer is if you happen to be standing at the North Pole. Okay, now what that means is when you're at the North Pole, south is everywhere. It doesn't matter what direction you're pointing. Okay, so if the man is pointing south, the only place you could answer this, I don't want to say it's not enough answer to him, because I'm telling you, he did shoot the bear. Okay, and these things are not contradictions in terms. If you're at the North Pole, you can walk, that bear can walk in any direction it wants. It's always going to look south to you. So if you shoot a bear at the North Pole, odds are it is a polar bear. Okay? So, <laughs> it is white. <laughs>